Scholar. I hope this video finds you all doing well. So what I'm going to do today is I am going to add on top of the foundation that we built up on the last video talking about posterior wall myocardial infarction. All right, so just some key points. The posterior wall of the heart, the back of the heart, it's not directly observed on a standard 12 lead ECG. However, there are some things that we can look at that strongly suggest the presence of a posterior wall STEMI. Uh, so first and foremost, generally speaking, posterior wall MIs are not isolated. That is to say that it's not as common to see a posterior wall MI by itself. Um, and we see this in approximately 3 to 10% of all cases of myocardial infarction. Typically, it's going to be associated with either an inferior or a lateral uh, myocardial infarction. And the reason being goes back to the last video that for the most part, people are right dominant. That is to say they, they have um, their posterior wall supplied uh, by the right coronary artery. Specifically, the posterior descending artery is supplied primarily by the RCA. And then in around 10 to 15 percent of patients, the circumflex will supply the PDA. Um, and that is the majority of the cases or the majority of humans will either have um, this right or left dominant circulatory pattern. And that's why we see it uh, more often than not associated with inf inferior lateral or infralateral uh, myocardial infarctions. Um, typically, the presence of a posterior wall infarction is going to cause increased damage to the left ventricle and may increase morbidity and mortality in patients. However, an isolated posterior wall STEMI may e be easily missed because we might write it off as a, um, an NSTEMI or uh, unstable angina or uh, a non-occlusive myocardial infarction. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the anterior leads, specifically leads V1 through V3, because these are directly reciprocal to the posterior wall. And so the concept of a reciprocal change comes in handy here. It is actually critical to understand. And reciprocal change is when you have elevation in leads that look at one area of the heart, um, a very powerful indicator of that elevation being due to coronary ischemia and injury and an acute occlusion of a coronary artery is that that elevation is accompanied by depression in areas of the heart that are completely opposite to that. And the classic area where we see this is actually in the inferior and high lateral leads. Uh, so leads 1 and AVL are um, quite reciprocal to the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF. And this is also the case when it comes to the anterior and posterior walls of the heart. And that would make sense that anterior is basically the front and posterior is basically the rear. So when we do a 12 lead, and you can see this 12 lead here, let me zoom in a little bit. We're looking at leads V1, V2, and V3, and you see ST depression in these leads. And whenever you see this depression, and some people will say if this depression has a plateau-like shape to it, so it has this flattened shape that you can see specifically in lead V1 here, that is even more evidence that we're dealing with a, a hit to the posterior wall. But I would say anytime you see noteworthy ST segment depression in V1 through V3, you need to strongly consider the possibility of a posterior wall STEMI. And this image comes uh, thanks to life in the fast lane under a Creative Commons license. And uh, there's the link uh, where you can find that specific uh, photograph. So the presence of ST depression in leads V1 through 3 suggests posterior wall MI, especially in the setting of an infralateral STEMI. And as you can see here, we have just a very classic presentation where I've got 
uh, ST elevation in the inferior leads and a little bit of elevation in the lateral leads as well. Um, and so you see that this is actually not an isolated posterior STEMI, but you could easily imagine um, no ST segment anomalies in all of these leads and still having this depression in V1, V2, V3 married with signs and symptoms of an acute coronary syndrome. And this would, that would by itself be powerful evidence that we are experiencing a myocardial infarction. So do not discount isolated ST depression in leads V1 through V3 as just ischemia or in STEMI, something that does not need to go to the cath lab. All right, so uh, something that you can do is uh, something referred to as the mirror criteria, where essentially you flip the ECG around and look at it like you're looking at it in a mirror. So I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna flip them around Right, you can just literally take the ECG and move it around, and that's what we've done here. And when you do that, that looks more like the classic ST elevation that you see in a STEMI. Um, and again, um, that's where kind of that um, that flattened appearance um, of that depression um, looks more like the classical ST elevation of a of a STEMI. Um, this suggests posterior wall infarct, all right? You can also do a, a modified 15 lead ECG. Um, and so essentially what you do is, you can do this with any of the precordial leads, but typically we'll use leads V4, V5, and V6. And we will move them off of the front and move them over to the back. And so here I have drawn a little picture for you all. And uh, so you can see that you've got the scapula here and just under the spine of the scapula, drop um, an electrode, and that becomes V8. And then um, just medial to that, between that and the spinal column, all right, in what's known as the paraspinal region or alongside the spine, drop another electrode, that becomes V9. And then what you want to do is uh, V6 would be over here in the, um, in the mid-axillary line. Um, between V6 and V8, you would drop another electrode, and that would become V7. And then what you'll do is you'll take V4 um, from the uh, front of the chest and move it over to V7. V5 off the front of the chest, move it over to V8 and then V6 off of the front of the chest and move it over to V9, all right? And then you will print off the 12 lead ECG again and circle V4, V5, and V6, and then manually write V7, V8, and V9 to let everybody know that this is a modified posterior uh, ECG. And what you will look for is the presence of elevation in those posterior leads. So that's exactly what we did here. We obtained the ECG again following posterior lead placement. V4, 5, and 6, label those as 7, 8, and 9. We've done that. And then you look for elevation in those leads. And if you see any elevation, then this strongly suggests posterior uh, wall STEMI um, or myocardial infarction and this is someone who needs to go emergently to the cath lab. All right, and then this is actually just another example of an ECG. I'm not talking about, uh, this is talking more about right ventricular infarction, uh, but uh, you can clearly see, if we look at this ECG here, uh, this is V1, V2, and V3, um, you can see I have got some pronounced depression in V1 and V2 specifically, and um, that strongly suggests the presence of a posterior STEMI, and we can see that the underlying uh, problem is a, a pretty notable STEMI uh, uh, in the inferior wall, uh, 2, 3 AVF, and then you've got some reciprocal changes so you've got elevation in 2, 3 AVF, so you've got inferior wall STEMI, and then you've got depression in 1 and AVL, um, which is uh, that classical uh, reciprocal change that we see with the infralateral uh, walls. So we've got an infraposterior STEMI, and then, of course, we've got a positive 
a right-sided ECG, uh, which suggests a right ventricular infarction. And this is actually a, a patient that I flew, um, and this patient was actually incredibly unstable. There's also, it's, it's a little hard to appreciate here, but there's also an underlying high-grade um, AV block. Um, so this patient's having a big inferior wall STEMI, their posterior wall's taking a hit, the right ventricle uh, was taking a hit, they had a, an AV block. Um, this patient is incredibly unstable. You can see a profoundly bradycardic. Uh, we're flying this patient from a small facility to um, a larger uh, center so they could go to the cath lab. Um, as I remember, this patient was on multiple vasoactive medications that we are titrating and attempting to increase the heart rate, um, increasing uh, the blood pressure. Uh, the patient was also um, intubated. Um, we were giving fluid boluses to try to support the blood pressure and to increase uh, preload. This is an incredibly critical patient. And as I recall, um, the outcome was not particularly good for this particular patient. Had a lot going on. But I just wanted to show you um, a quote-unquote real-world example of posterior STEMI um, in, in an actual patient uh, without any specific uh, patient details, of course. And you can see that this is, again, accompanied by an inferior wall STEMI. But you could just as easily imagine that there were no ST segment changes or any uh, changes of the J point. That is to say that all the other leads were normal with nothing but depression in V1 and V2. And that alone with signs and symptoms of, acute, of an acute coronary syndrome uh, would still suggest the presence of an isolated posterior wall MI. And uh, this is again a patient that needs to go immediately to the cath lab, even though they may not meet the standard STEMI criteria, this is still falls under that umbrella of, of an OMI or um, what we call a, a STEMI equivalent. Okay, everybody, hopefully uh, that was helpful. Hopefully this makes sense. And I hope to begin talking about Scarbosa's criteria or uh, specifically I'm going to focus on the um, modified Smith uh, criteria, which is a, a a modified way of using Scarbosa criteria, I think, is a little easier uh, to use than what was originally developed by Dr. Scarbosa. And uh, I'm not sure what the timeline for that's going to be because that's going to be a little more detailed, a little more nuanced, and so I'm going to have to put a lot more work into it. And classes actually start uh, full time in earnest tomorrow, so I'm going to be very busy for the next uh, few weeks as I settle into the new school year, but we'll see what we can do. All right, everyone, thank you so much, and we'll see you in the next video.